This is Black Market Leadership, the underground resource for disruptors and status quo breakers. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Black Market Leadership. You know, if you're listening to this podcast, you know I'm always interested in strategy. I, I quote Sun Tzu, Klauswitz, uh, sometimes Michael Porter. Uh, I'm very interested, but there's a concept out there, which frankly, I've never heard of called a strategic narrative. Now I've heard of a narrative and you know you can make that strategic, but it seems to me there's a new discipline out there that uh, it's really, really rising in popularity. And frankly, my next guest today uh, if there's an expert in the strategic narrative, it's this gentleman, and that person is Andy Raskin. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Kevin? I am fantastical. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've been following you, gosh, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe a little over a year, but you have some of the best observations and posts on LinkedIn, and I'm like, who is this guy? Because I'm reading about the strategic narrative. I'm like, what the hell is this? And the more I read about what you do, I'm thoroughly fascinated. And I think for the audience here, uh, you know, we, lo we love talking about disruptors and people who are status quo breakers. And it seems to me like, uh, you know, you're heading up a new discipline in, in marketing. And I'd love to just pick your brain and, and let's let the audience know that, you know, that this work exists and we can, and, you know, dive into it. How does that sound? Sounds good. Um, I guess the first thing I'll say is I actually don't think of it as marketing. Um, I really do think of it as a leadership discipline that literally what we're talking about, you know, I, I think because it's the word narrative and it like involves words, like people seem to go to, oh, that's a marketing thing. Uh, but actually, uh, I think I, I realized very early on that uh, this is really a literally a strategic uh, discipline that we're going to, you know, wh how do we express strategy? There's a lot of different uh, answers to that. You know, uh, it's, you mentioned Porter's, Michael Porter. So there's, you know, okay, you can do a big presentation about the five forces. Uh, you can make a mission statement, uh, envision statement. You can, you know, marketers have these like positioning frameworks and all kinds of stuff. But I really came to the best to feel that the best articulation of strategy is a narrative. OK, I love this. So let's just jump into this. I'm going to ask about your bio later, but let's just what is a strategic narrative? So a strategic narrative is the story that the leader is telling that uh, they are uh, using to uh, enroll other people to make true. So uh, every leader, I think, is really, um, you know, what is leadership? Uh, I would define it as it is the art of enrolling others to make a story come true. And <laughs> If you define it that way, then, well, you better know what the story is <laughs> that you're trying to make come true. You know, what's funny, uh, uh, I have a definition of leadership that I use, and I, I always say it's the art and science of influencing others to actualize a vision, mm -hmm. the most mm -hmm. constructive manner practical. I think we're speaking the same language. Uh, the story, though, you know, one of the things I, I get to do is I, I, I read a book a long time ago. Uh, it's called Masks of War made in the 80s by the Rand Corporation. And, and what it does, it, it actually talks about the different services and all the service rivalry, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army. And the one thing the Navy has over all the other services, it has a history. You know, when you ask someone in the Navy what they do, they don't say, well, I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know, I don't know the titles of the ranks Navy. But let's say the first thing they say is, I'm in the U.S. Navy. They carry that institution very personally because they know the story of John Paul Jones, all these heroes. It, it seems to me like that seems to be a, a major, major animating factor in making the organizations effective. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, you know, these like sort of history origin stories are, are really interesting and give people a sense of, of uh, you know, belonging. Um, but, you know, I think there's a bigger story that motivates probably all the armed forces of every country, you know, which is some 
some version of, you know, the world is like this and we want to make it like that, uh, you know, and where I started to get, you know, really fascinated by this was to see that there was this there there was this kind of structure to the narrative that really successful leaders were telling, especially in business, you know, so, um, you know, if we go back to like uh, Mark Benioff, when he starts Salesforce, you know, the traditional way he did, he doesn't, he doesn't, I don't think he did Porter's five forces. Um, I don't, I don't think he did positioning maps or anything like this. What he did was he, he came up with this very simple story about, Hey, software is over. So there's a, there, so he, he, I don't know if you old enough to remember this, but he had this, uh, these signs, it just had the word software with like one of those no smoking, you know, uh, diagonal lines, circles, slash, and, you know, software is over. And you can imagine like, this is quite a provocative statement. Um, of course, what he means is, you know, software in the sense of something that you're gonna own and run in your own data centers and all that. And then he says, hey, the new world is the cloud, you know, and, and this is Salesforce. And that narrative, there was an old game that we all played and probably a lot of us still playing at that time, you know, software. And now there's a new game called the cloud. And that's what we're about. We're, we're about helping you win that new game. And the story is all about, hey, if you continue to play that old game, we're dead. Um, you're dead. Um, bad things are going to happen, right? So this structure just got really, I was really fascinated by that. It was a very different uh, structure from the way that most, that you're taught to, to kind of build a pitch. And I saw that at Salesforce, wow, that it wasn't just the marketing pitch or the sales pitch. This is the thing that unites everybody is our mission to, you know, uh, to get to, to, to kill software and uh, accelerate the movement to the cloud. And you see the same thing, Tesla, you know, uh, it's all about this movement to a sustainable future. Uh, and we're going to kill fossil fuels, you know. This structure I found, uh, I, I started to see everywhere where there were, you know, successful leaders like this. Uh, um, so I guess the one thing that the question I would have is what, what differentiates, let's say, a vision from a, uh, a strategic narrative? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I, I've never, I've never kind of figured out really what a vision is, meaning you hear like mission statement, vision statement. Um, some people have very clear definitions of what they are, but there's a lot of, but people differ on what those are supposed to be. Sometimes they're like opposite each other. <laughs> like sometimes people say the mission is the short-term thing and the vision is a long-term thing. And sometimes, so, um, you know, we're talking about definitions of things and I do believe, yes, I believe that this is a vision, but it's expressed in narrative terms, which is to say, you know, what most visions I hear is, you know, we, we, we're going to be the biggest this or that, right? It's like some sort of self-centered, uh, sort of like glory <laughs> dream. And, you know, if you think about the ones I've talked to you about so far, that's not what it is. It's, it's, Hey, we see the world moving to it. We, we see the way the game that the world is playing now is 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 a road to ruin. And we see uh, this new game that if we can play and win, uh, we're going to all thrive. Uh, and so I think it does function as what some people might call a vision. I just think it's important to put it in narrative terms so that we're, we can, we can uh, say it that way and then connect product and all kinds of things to that, to that story and that shift. You know, no, I, I totally makes sense. In fact, uh, you know, as you're saying that, I guess if I think, if I think of a, a, I guess the traditional idea of a vision, it's almost like just a snapshot of the future. But if you throw a snapshot of the future, I have my experiences and knowledge. You have your experiences and knowledge. We probably have different ways of how we proceed to get there. But it seems to me almost like, that strategic narrative, it fills in the guts to, to the skeleton call of vision. It, it lets people know exactly what we're doing, where we're going, and it does in a way that people can connect. Is that Yeah, and say? I think just something you said um, 
really struck a chord with me. I, I forget exactly what I said, but it's but it's also about the urgency. So if we just talk about, hey, here's our bold vision for the future, you know, a lot of people, you know, there's this there's this um, there's this dynamic that happens in a lot of stories called refusal of the call, which is this is like when I don't know if you remember this in Star Wars, but like. You know, Luke is kind of belly aching at the beginning. He wants to be a pilot. He wants to go out into space, you know, he's, but he's got to do chores. And so what happens? Obi-Wan comes, you know, this old man shows up. Hey, let's go on this adventure. I'm going to take you out into space, teach you about the force. Here's a lightsaber. Isn't that cool? What does Luke say? He says, mm, you know, it's getting late. I got to go home. And this is, you know, who does that sound like? It, it sounds like the person you're trying to enroll whether that's you know you're selling selling them a product or a vision or whatever it is, and and I think the reason is because there's not urgency, right? There's the person still is hanging on to, uh, you know, hey, well, yeah, that sounds great in the future that you that vision you're painting sounds great, but you know, I'm okay. Yeah, I was complaining. Yeah, I have my ups and downs, but I'm sort of okay. So the narrative in in not just talking about the future, but talking about the shift from the current to the future and, and what's why is it deadly to will it be deadly to stay with the future with, with the present and the present game, then you're building in an urgency story. So what happens in Star Wars uh, after one, you know, shortly after Luke says, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to pass uh, the Empire kills his, his uh, family. And now it's pretty clear, like, wow, if I keep playing this sort of complaining teenager game, uh, I'm, I'm doomed. They're probably going to get me next. I got to I got to change. It seems like there's almost a uh, a challenge built into the strategic narrative, as I understand, almost like this is what's happening. We got to change. But you know what? If I'm hungry and I got that fire in my belly, if I'm a startup and I want those people like me. I want that challenge. I want to know I'm on this journey. Exactly. I mean, when I build a strategic narrative with CEOs, so I usually build it with CEOs and have them supported by a small leadership group. Uh, but then once we get to a place where we feel like it's pretty good, you know, they start using it. And one of the things I, I just heard recently from a CEO was was uh, was sort of starting to road test it in the re in the real world, you know, in in, in uh, out in the wild. And he said, yeah, on recruiting calls, I'll, I'll use the strategic narrative and it's like, do I see the fire in their eyes, <laughs> you know? And, you know, is this exciting to them? And uh, it's usually, he told me like a, a really good, you know, predictor of is this person gonna be a good fit for us? Oh, I love it, I love it. Okay, so you brought up, you work with CEOs and I guess a smaller executive leadership team. Um, okay, first of all, who, who reaches out to you? What kind of CEO reaches out to you? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I, I still feel like it's a minority of CEOs who see this as their job. You know, see that like, like you were kind of saying in the beginning. Oh, it sounds like marketing thing. Yeah, you know, that's that's yeah. I'll I'll de delegate that to my marketing department. So it's the kind of CEO who who sees this, who starts, who's seeing that these very successful companies are tend to be led by this person who has who who really promotes this story you know a great example um uh company called zwara that i write about a lot uh zwara in case you don't know them they they power the subscription uh billing for a lot of things, you know, like software or things like that that you might use on a, on a regular basis. You're not seeing it, you know, it's happening behind the scenes. But when they first started, they first started around 2013 and, and they, they, the CEO, uh, he came from Salesforce, which is no uh, accident, I think. His name is Tian Suo. And Tian uh, started by saying, hey, uh, the old, the way we used to buy, which is transactions, I'm gonna buy something outright from you, that's over. Uh, now the new world is going to be subscription. We're going to be in this new thing called the subscription economy. And he almost acts as if what he's selling is not Zora's software, which of course he is, but he's what he's selling is that that story uh, about this shift 
from transactions to subscription economy. And I think, you know, I, I wrote about, I wrote a post about uh, him and that his pitch and how it, how it's kind of breaking down the pieces of that strategic narrative. It got a lot of attention. Um, it's about five years old now, but it's got about 3 million views. And still CEOs read that and say, yes, that's what I want to uh, have. And that's often, uh, I think, the the uh, sort of trigger for people to contact me. Um, there's also now, like I've worked with a lot of different CEOs who, you know, other CEOs ask them, well, how, where do you, why, why are you telling that story? I, I worked with a team where uh, it was kind of a small startup is bootstrapped, although they had reached not that small. They, they, they had reached uh, quite a bit of uh, scale, but then they got acquired by this really big company, the big public company. And the CEO told me, hey, um, you know, our, our narrative was a big part of why we got acquired uh, because we were able, it helped us sell them on kind of what, what our, and so I was a little skeptical at first. And then I got a call from the CEO of the public company. <laughs> hey, you know, one of the reasons we bought them was this, was that story. And Hey, could we talk about our story? Um, so, uh, I guess, you know, once someone starts doing it and they, and they're, you know, people start seeing the success they get, then I guess other CEOs start to say, Hmm, yeah, that's maybe that's something I'd like to do. Uh, this is why one of the reasons I'm really fascinated with, because I've, you know, you don't, I don't know if you know this, but I've done, I do a lot of, uh, besides leadership, I do strategy advisement and I use computer war games. I bring executives in and, and they war game one another and they actually see each other under pressure. But one of the things I've noticed is for my work to be successful, I need, I require a chief executive who's going to st- walk the walk and talk the talk and keep his people's feet to the fire. We, we, we have these templates. We're going to use them. And that, that to me, that seems like that might be a challenge with the strategic narrative because I can see the value in it. The CEO may love it, but the CEO, the CFO, uh, sales, marketing, they all have to have buy-in and they have to consistently do it. it do you find that to be, I guess this is probably a, a rhetorical question, but is that a <laughs> challenge for you? You know, you're hitting on what I'd say, like, if I've gotten better at this work at all, it's been by learning how to better balance the two things you're talking about, which is CEO ownership, authorship, really, of this story um, and the team buy in. Uh, And so in my process, I've I've kind of I'm I'm always uh, I'm always changing it a little bit based on things I learned. But really trying to uh, balance those two things. So I'll usually start with a kickoff session uh, with all of them. So the CEO and then, you know, head of sales, head of marketing, head of product. Uh, Sometimes it's like a co-founder or COO kind of person who's like really, you know, sort of each organization is a little different on like who I'm kind of trying to balance, like who has the inputs to the story, like, you know, just literally understands the market and what this company is trying to do. And who are the people who are just super critical to own it and champion it going forward to, to, to smell their own scent on it, you know, <laughs> not reject it as foreign tissue. And, um, and then I start with a big kickoff session where I'm training the teams and the CEO together on the structure that I'm talking about on all the different pieces that make it work. Um, but most of it is asking the team, like, what are these pieces? Um, and you can imagine we come out with like boards and boards of notes and ideas about what this thing should be, right? And so then um, I do two things. One is I ask them to start talking to customers and asking them some similar questions because sometimes the the customer will say, say it in a way that we never thought to say it. Um, and sometimes it's like, it's duh, you know, like, like we just didn't like, I'll give you one, one team I worked with, we were trying to come up with this word for like what every sort of like consumer product company wants to be. And somehow we didn't, somehow when we interviewed one of, one of them, that was a client of this company, the, the CEO said, yeah, we want to be a household brand. And somehow this, this phrase household brand didn't come to us. It's like, it's not, not rocket science, but somehow we didn't think of it. And, and then we started using that and like, yeah, oh yeah, that's what I want to, you know, it just really, really resonated. Um, but then I'm also working with the CEO one-on-one to start boiling down what we've gotten from the team and from the customers into the first draft of this narrative. And 
Then I have them present that to this small team of people, like you said, who we need to have their buy-in. And I ask them two questions, what's working and not working? And I always tell the CEOs, heads up, like this is gonna be the worst part of our work together. Like this is gonna be the low point because you can imagine, you know, like all the, all the, the reports have given the CEO like their gold ideas for what this story should be. And now the CEO has pretty much had to throw out most of them, maybe 98% to get to something clean. Um, good news is the team I find is always right about what's working and not working, like like the general direction this thing has to go to get better. And so the, the, the CEO and I go back to the drawing board and rebuild it and come back to them. And and I found like, and so, so keep doing kind of stuff like this and gradually, you know, we're building alignment among the team. They're getting their input. The CEO is getting to make decisions. Um, that's how I found so far the best way to balance those two things. So what is, okay, we're talking, we, we've been talking, I would say conceptually about a strategic narrative. What exactly does a strategic narrative sound like? I mean, are we talking about a, a, a 30 second pitch, a one minute story, a five minute video? I mean, what are the different forms? This is a great question. And it's really like the first question I had to wrestle with when I started doing this work. Like, yeah, we want to tell this story that is going to kind of pervade everything uh, like recruiting, investor talk, you know, customer. And where are we going to write that down and in what format? And the traditional answer to that question, you know, in, in, in business, especially B2B, everywhere, is we're going to write it down in a place the world never sees. So it's going to be in some kind of internal, I don't know, vision deck. Um, marketers call like our messaging house. It's it's some internal like sort of document that that codifies the story and the pieces of it, but it's not something the world sees. So the, the idea of it is people are going to always come back to this thing um, like this positioning guide or messaging guide or strategy guide. And when I knew, do need to build something, you know, that I'm going to show customers or, or, the, or the world or investors or whatever, I'll pull messages from this thing and pull thinking from this thing and it'll guide me to create this. I found that that would break down for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, people wouldn't go back to it. They'd forget, especially outside of the marketing department, they wouldn't go back. And second, like I think it's very hard for most people to take fragments of messages, some high level, you know, hey, this is our story and bake them into things that people actually see. So I thought really hard about this question when I started and like what would work better. Um, and I came to the sales pitch that uh, that the, the, and this is a controversial decision, um, which you can see if you see my LinkedIn uh, feed, I've been writing about it lately and getting a lot of, <laughs> a lot of like, what? I'm, I mean, basically, you know, in business school, we're taught that the, you know, um, we should have a mission, like is a mission statement, vision statement, Porter's five forces, positioning, all these things are going to like define the strategy. And what I find works better is the sales deck. Uh, and, uh, because, we yes we want to do all that thinking about you know how to position and stuff all all the rest but hey if we can't codify that if we can't ex communicate that in a sales conversation that's going to be you know relatively short so I'm not saying an elevator pitch that's three seconds but you know a reasonably short amount of time with a first prospect which is you know for for the companies I'm working with like that's the most important uh, you know communication channel then, you know, what, then, then maybe how do we know it's working? So when you're asking, what are we, what are we building? I'm always, I'm building it as the sales pitch. Um, but the way this sales pitch is structured, um, is different from the traditional pitch. So the traditional pitch is structured. What's your problem here? You have a problem. Um, I have the solution. Let me tell you why it's better than the other solutions. That's what I call the bragging doctor, <laughs> right? Even if it's true, maybe maybe you do have the best cure. I don't know, like, but but you know, the structure is, you know, hey, I got the best, and this structure is different. Um, you know, when when uh, Tian Suo starts out and says, hey, you know, we're now li living in a subscription economy, he's not talking about a problem. Now, of course, there's going to be problems that that raises that he'll try, his software will try to help you solve. But the 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 getting into it is 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 very different structure.
If you like this content and want to hear other things like it, head on over to the website at blackmarketleadership.com. That's blackmarketleadership.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast and you can even create a free member's profile 